thank you for everyone being here, and uh, it's, good, it's a great honor to be here to give my first Black Hat talk, and uh, I'm very excited standing here, and hope that all of you guys can enjoy this talk. So particularly, uh, the winter is coming back, uh, is to pay tribute to, pay tribute to classics, uh, one of my favorite HBO television series, The Game of Thrones. So winter is coming. Uh, is a motto of a main, main character, the house dad. So let me briefly introduce uh, the speakers. So I'm Zi Zhang. I'm from PhD, I'm a, st a PhD student from the University of New South Wales. And the first speaker is Yue Changchen. Uh, he is a security research scientist at the Baidu Security Research Lab. He's uh, he is sitting uh, in the front in the first row. And the third speaker is Su Yao Lipo. Uh, he is my supervisor, and uh, he is a principal research scientist at uh, CSIRO Australia. The last speaker is Zhi Wang. He is an associate professor at Florida State University. So uh, in the very first place, I will uh, briefly introduce the Rohammer bug and the, uh, give, uh, give the most advanced software-only defense against the, the, the Rohammer attack. And then we developed a proof concept and uh, gave, uh, gave three uh, possible mitigations as well. At last, uh, we gave our sound bites of this talk. So, so what is a hammer? Uh, literally speaking, hammering a row is to frequently access a row. Uh, <coughs> so because the, because the density of DRAM cells in the DRAM modules uh, can uh, increases significantly, and uh, these cells can, inter uh, can electrically uh, interact with each other. So, by frequently accessing a row, can uh, cause the electrical charge of its adjacent row uh, disturbance. So, let's uh, firstly let's dive into the background of the DRAM structure. So, the theme is called the dual inline memory module, and it has one or two racks corresponding to its uh, front or back side. And uh, each rank has multiple chips, and multiple chips uh, make up uh, multiple backs. So the cause of row hammer lies in the back, a very basic unit for the memory access. So on the right side of the picture, uh, we can say that uh, each bank has rows of cells, and uh, each cell consists of a capacitor and an access transistor. So on the right side of the picture, the wall line collects all the cells in within a row, and uh, the B line collects all the uh, cells within a column. So both the wall line and B line have a direct impact on how the, how, uh, how memory access is performed. So for the memory access, we have three primary steps. The first step is to activate or open the row. So specifically, uh, the the rows or wall line is raised to a high voltage enabling the row's access transistors, and this will collect uh, the row's capacitors to the bit line. As such, um, the row's data will be read out into the row buffer. In the same time, the row's capacitors will be fully charged to be refreshed. So in the second step, the row buffer will satisfy the memory, ac mem mem memory access as required. So if, uh, memory access, if the memory access is completed or Another memory, ac memory access occurs in the same back. Mm. The, the current row need to be closed. So the row's uh, wall line is discharged to a low voltage, uh, disabling the row's access transistors. And this will disconnect the row's capacitors from the B line. So <coughs> and in the meantime, the row buffer will also be cleared. So up to now, everything seems going well. but. Unfortunately, the capacitors of cells will lose charge over time, and uh, all, the, all the rows of cells need to be refreshed at a periodic time, and uh, the typical periodic time is 64 milliseconds. So because the, because the capacitors will lose charge gradually and uh, need to be recharged at a periodic time, in 2014, Kim, uh, reported a key observation that frequently opening rows n plus one and n minus one will cause um, b flip b flips in row n. The b flip means that the row, uh, some cells in row n have been permanently b flipped from uh, b zero to b one or b one to b zero. So motivated by the Kim's observation, 
Sabon from the Google uh, was the first to compromise the bug free kernel and gain the kernel privilege by the means of Rohammer. <coughs> so uh, the critical uh, the critical Rohammer code uh, written by the Kim uh, is placed on the right side. So we can say that uh, to uh, we assume that x is in row n plus one and y is in row n minus one. To to induce b flips in row n, we must access x and y in a loop, and uh, inside this loop, we need to uh, flush the x and the y's cache, and also the row buffer, also the row buffer where the x and y resides. So, to flush the CPU cache, we can usually we can use the self flush instruction. Alternatively, we can use other we can stuff other data's cache to evict the target data's cache. Also, to have a direct impact on the on the row n, we need to clear the row buffer. Thus, as such, we use uh, we perform alternate access of x and y uh, repeatedly. So. By the way, uh, the, the line six, the, uh, the M fence instruction is unnecessary to induce B flips, and uh, this is also been uh, this is also reported by Sebong. So currently, we have three existing Rohammer methods. The first is double-sided Rohammer. So it hammers two rows uh, on on each side of the target row, and uh, this method requires virtual to physical address mapping as well as the uh, uh, physical address to DRAM row, DRAM row uh, mapping. The second is single sided hammer. It randomly selects a pair of addresses, and uh, it is likely for the pair of addresses are in the same back and thus clear the row buffer. The last one is one location hammer. It randomly selects one address, so it relies on the DRAM um, memory controller to clear the row buffer. So take the code again as an example. We can say that for double-sided Rohammer, x and y are adjacent to the target row. For the single-sided Rohammer, either x or y is adjacent to the target row. So what are the two methods in common is that x and y must be in the same back so as to clear the row buffer. And this requirement does not focus the one location Rohammer. X is just uh, adjacent to the target row, and uh, the DRAM controller is responsible for for the row buffer clearance. So <coughs> to mitigate to mitigate the Rohammer attack, uh, numerous uh, Rohammer defenses has been have been proposed. Uh, we have two categories. Uh, the first is the first one is uh, so hardware defense. Uh, uh, this uh, solution uh, these solutions these hardware solutions require the require the hardware changes to the legacy DRAM modules. So that uh, that's uh, that's why they are not practical. So the hardware defense, the first intuitive solution is to increase the row refreshing frequency from 62 milliseconds, as I uh, mentioned before, to 32 milliseconds. But, but um, so uh, this, the idea behind, the, behind this uh, solution is that an attacker uh, can must activate the row for many times so, to, so as to induce B flips in, uh, in its adjacent rows. So we increase the we increase the frequency so, uh, so as to pre refresh the rows as, as soon as possible. And this will prevent the rows from being, uh, p uh, the victim row from being bit flipped. But however, the one, once, uh, one Rohammer exploit has, uh, has already succeeded, giving the frequency of 32 milliseconds. The second solution is to introduce error correcting code memory. Uh, that's called the ECC. ECC is able to uh, correct one bit errors and uh, detect double bit errors. Uh, however, uh, the Rohammer bug can induce multiple bit flips and this cannot be properly detected by ECC. Uh, and the third one is to apply probabilistic adjacent row activation. So as the name suggests, um, para, uh, para is to intensive, read, intensive reading from a row will trigger an activation of its adjacent rows with a high probability. And this will prevent the adjacent rows from being, uh, from linking charge at a much, uh, at a much faster, uh, at a much faster rate. So, the, um, the other one. Similarly, the, uh, we can use, we can utilize the target row refreshing capability to ask the memory controller to refresh specified rows. The last one is to uh, specify maximum activation count. So, all of the last three methods require. 
uh, hardware changes to the legacy DRAM modules. So when we come to the practical defense, the software defense, uh, we also have two subcategories. Uh, the first category the, is ad, ad, uh, ad hoc solutions. But uh, these solutions are primarily limited to preventing specific rule hammer attacks, uh, which uh, utilize uh, certain system features, such as a pitch table. Pitch table is used to translate a virtual address to a physical address. But uh, this, page, the, this interface has already been disabled for an unprivileged user. And uh, the pitch map is used to facilitate the double sided rule hammer. So uh, we focus more on the general solutions. Firstly, we analyze, uh, we, use, we use a binary code uh, analysis to analyze common behaviors exposed in the Ruhamba exploits, such as uh, high resolution timers and the uh, catch flash instructions. However, uh, an attacker can introduce the uh, enclaves into, um, by Intel SGX to bypass the binary check or use uh, network packets to trick remote Ruhamba exploits. The second one is to um, perform a complete row hammer test and then blacklist all the vulnerable rows. On one hand, this solution can eliminate the row hammer bug. On the other hand, uh, this solution will render more than 95% of the system memory unusable. So it is also uh, not practical. The, the last one is to utilize the performance counter. So as the row hammer will, in, will incur high cache miss rates, Intuitively, we can use performance counters to observe the uh, cache miss rate. Uh, um, when the cache miss rate reaches the threshold, a monitoring process can be triggered to check whether a real Ruhamba exploit is running. But this method has false positives and uh, incurs high performance overhead. So now um, we come to the most advanced software only defense, CAT. Uh, please note that. The, uh, this defen uh, two, two new defenses emerged after our submission, so we will talk, uh, talk about them in the mitigation section. So from a high level, CAT is a physical isolation scheme. Just, that's a, just like this picture shows, uh, the, the island is split into two halves. One half is physically isolated to, from the other. So for CAT, it divides, divides the physical memory into mutually exclusive partitions and view the ownership of each physical partition as single. So if, uh, as this picture shows, um, the, the, domain, the domain has only access to its own partition A, and uh, any, memory ac any memory requests from, the, from, a indi from an individual domain will be only served by its own partition. So uh, in a nutshell, the single ownership means that each secret domain has, has access to its own partition. So to its current, to CAT's uh, current implementation, CAT divides the physical memory into user and the kernel partition. And, uh, and this row, and this guardian row is placed between these partitions. So any B flips uh, induced by an attacker will only occur in her own partition, sorry, will only occur in her own partition, the user partition. And, uh, or in the or in the guardian rows, and this will make the B flips useless. So, cat is cat is only a software, software only software software only approach with uh, without a modification, without hardware modifications, and uh, it is practical to protect um, legacy systems. Furthermore, we can utilize cat to. Uh, Build other fine grade uh, domain isolation, such as uh, browser and sandbox isolation, and the privi privilege process and the uh, regular process isolation, and so on and so forth. So eventually, the cat, the cat, uh, the cat uh, at home catches the mouse jerry. So before we compromise the cat, uh, let's uh, summarize. Uh, Case, uh, case steps required for Ruham exploit. Firstly, we need to fill up a victim row with sensitive data structures such as uh, page tables. And next, we position attacker accessible rows adjacent to the victim row. And last, we perform the Ruham. Uh, if we gain privilege escalation, then we succeed. So let's review all the defenses. So all the defenses are prior to CAT uh, are trying to mitigate the first and the last step. 
and uh, what they are trying, what they are managed to do is to uh, elim eliminate or detect the hammer bug. But for cat, it is tolerant to the hammer, and uh, it is trying to p prevent the attack, uh, the victim role from being approached by the attacker accessible roles. So for our attack, we assume that the kernel is bug free and uh, protected by cat. So, as such, the user and the kernel isolation are isolated from each other. So, since, uh, since the kernel is protected by cat, we have no idea about where the vulnerable roles are located in the kernel partition. And uh, the last is that we have no access to the page map. So, is it possible for us to rule the kernel? Yes, of course, otherwise we wouldn't be able to stand here. Yeah, so, uh, we we have uh, we have listed the five key steps for our successful Rohammer exploit. The first is to clearly identify the cat's weakness and then abuse the weakness to stealthily position attacker accessible memory adjacent to the kernel objects. In this case, we use the page tables. And the third step is to perform uh, efficient single-sided Rohammer because we have low we have low page map interface. And the fourth step is to verify whether exploitable bit flips have occurred. And if yes, if not, we try again. And if yes, uh, we have gained the pre kernel privilege, and then we can scan the kernel memory, flush TLB, and change user ID to zero. So the main challenges lies in the fir first three steps, and uh, then we and then next we talk about them in detail. So in theory. Uh, the single ownership dictated by cat does hold, but in real world, in modern system, the modern system views the ownership as dynamic, particularly the double ownership. So what is double ownership? Um, let's see this picture. So the, so the memory region X has, has two owners, the, the domain A and domain B, and uh, a similar situation also occurs to partition B, the region Z. So let's, uh, to illustrate the double ownership, we use a real world scenario to illustrate. Mm. So if, uh, let's regard the domain as a user domain, the domain B as a kernel domain. So if user domain wants to perform a uh, direct IO write operation, the, domain, the kernel domain will allocate the region X for, for the user domain to process data. At this moment, the region X it just has just uh, one owner, the user domain. But but when the but when the kernel domain access the region X to copy data into a device, then then at this time the region X, the ownership of region X is converted into double. So that's that's the that's where the double ownership comes from. And uh, actually an um, adversary usually, usually uh, resides in the user domain and uh, she must get access to a high privilege memory region so as to perform a meaningful Rohammer. So the region Z is what we are interested to identify. So for the, for the user and the kernel domain, um, we want to identify the region Z, and uh, we term such a region Z as hammerable. So the user after kernel, for, the, for, the, uh, for this uh, model, we have two types of double ownership. Uh, the first is uh, kernel after user, and the, the second is user after kernel. So the region Z uh, refers to a, a, memory, a kernel memory region that is initially owned by the kernel domain, and then the user domain joins the ownership. So this region, this region Z, is what an adversary is interested to identify. So uh, we summarize the properties of hammerable buffer. So the hammerable, the hammerable memory is initially owned by the kernel, and uh, an unprivileged user can access this memory. So the challenge is to identify the hammerable memory in the real-world systems. Um, like the previous slide, for the split island, uh, the bridge interface is introduced to counteract the physical isolation. For, similarly, for the split partitions, MMAP interface can be abused to hammer the kernel partition. So the kernel will allocate the region Z and uh, map the region Z into the user domain by the means of MMAP system call. 
So at this time, the region Z is potentially hammerable, and uh, this is and uh, s this gives us the hint we can search all the MMAP operations for that have the hammerable memory. So in this picture, we can see that the number of MMAP operations increases significantly as the Linux kernel involves, and uh, for for a specific Linux kernel 4.17, the device drivers have uh, ha has a much higher number of MMAP operations, and uh, so it is highly likely for the device drivers ha having the hammerable memory. So as a use case, we have identified SSI generic buffer in the Linux SSI subsystem as a hammerable memory. So. So up to now, we have identified the cat's weakness. So next, uh, we have to stealthily position the hammer buffer next to page table. And we have proposed a new technique, the memory ambush, to address this problem. So for the Linux body locator, uh, it maintains multiple lists of blocks. For, uh, for blocks that have the same list, they have the same memory size. And every block has a power of two number of pages, and uh, these pages are physically continuous. So the dash line, the dash line means that once a block is split into two equal blocks, the split block has the same size as the as uh, for example, this one has a smaller size as a smaller one, and uh, the unused sorry, the unused split block um, will be linked into the smaller block list. So. Here is the question. If hammerable buffer and the page table share a random block, like this one, are they for sure adjacent to each other? The answer is no, because two adjacent physical addresses do not imply two adjacent DRAM rows. For example, uh, the addresses 1 triple 0 and uh, 0 triple F, they are physically continuous, but they are in the same row instead of two adjacent rows. Fortunately, two row aligned adjacent physical addresses indicate two adjacent DRAM rows. This is because that the DRAM controller uses the most significant bits of a physical address to select a DRAM row. So, with, um, so we call the block that should be shared by the two objects as the target block, and the target block should contain the, should contain the size of two adjacent rows. And uh, any block that has a larger size, we call uh, we call the we call it a large block. And any block that has a smaller size, we call it small block. So to to determine the size of target blocks, we have three equations. So the size of a target block should be, uh, should be twice the size of all the rows per row index, and uh, all the and the size of all the rows per row index is further determined by the number of themes, the number of backs per one dim and uh, the size of a single row in a single back. So um, this, uh, this, solves the, this solves the problem of how, this, uh, this solves the problem of how we determine the uh, target, target block size. And, uh, to, and, and uh, as we have no knowledge about where the vulnerable locations in the kernel memory, we have to place uh, more page table pages onto the target box. So, we abuse the MMAP to do page table allocation. As we, as we know, the MMAP is used to map a file or device into a memory, and the Sabon has abused this feature to control the page table allocation. So specifically, um, we create a memory mapped region. We create a memory mapped region and uh, use the, and populate the region by accessing, like uh, write or read this region. So. The page table pages will be allocated. The page table pages will be allocated to translate the virtual addresses to physical addresses. So uh, in this, uh, during this period of time, the page table pages will be allocated. So with all this knowledge in mind, we uh, not, we now describe the key steps uh, required for our memory batch technique. So in this figure, uh, it shows the initial state of the kernel memory. And uh, 
the kernel memory also has has uh, multiple lists of different blocks, and uh, some small small blocks have already been allocated have already been allocated for uh, like the network ring buffer. So if we want to uh, share the target blocks between the two objects, we have to train the small blocks first. So in, in Figure B, we train uh, we exhaust all the small blocks using the paste tables. And by the by the means of uh, MMAP system call, so after we exhaust the small blocks, we can we start to allocate the double owned buffers and the paste tables from the target blocks, and if and if the paste and if the double owned buffers complete its allocation, we still uh, we still continue uh, doing the paste table allocation until a specified memory threshold is reached. So that's where make our technique uh, stealthy. So um, after we position after positioning the attacker accessible rows adjacent to the page tables, now we have um, the last problem to address: no page map since Linux 4.0. So we resort to a timing channel. The uh, the result uh, the timing channel is that as the previous slides have also have already shown, X and Y are in different rows of the same back, and uh, the row buffer and in inside this loop, if we access X and Y repeatedly, um, the row buffer will be repeatedly loaded, reloaded, and uh, cleared. So this will call the uh, phenomenon, the row conflict, because uh, X and Y will have a higher access latency compared compared to uh, if the X and Y are in the, are in different backs. So uh, we we abuse the row conflict to help us select addresses that are in the same back, so we can perform an efficient single-sided row hammer. Specifically, we uh, we select 1,000 pairs that are in the same bank of different rows, and uh, another 1,000 pairs that are that are in different backs, and measure the access latency respectively. So in this demo machine, we can see that uh, more than more than 92 percent of the more than 92% of the pairs in the DSP have more than 360 cycles, and uh, more than 97% of the pairs in the long DSP have less than 360 cycles. Also, in this uh, Lilova machine, we, we can say that 100% of the pairs in the long in the DSP have more than 360 cycles, and more than 99% of the pairs in the long DSP. Have less than 360 cycles. So based on this latency, we can select the addresses more wisely. So the first prime, the first three primary steps have been completed, and now we need to verify whether exploitable bit flips have occurred. So the idea of verification is like uh, is that um, if if an, an if an, a virtual page is no longer pointing to a physical page. Then we make then we can make sure that a, a page table has been be flipped, and uh, if we can find another page pointing to pointing to a page table page, uh, it means that we have gained the kernel privilege because an um, unexploitable page table means that we can um, write or read um, access to all the physical memory. So after that after that we can scan the kernel memory and uh, change the user ID to zero. To, so as to gain the root privilege. So now let's show, uh, we will give a more demo to show how we gain the privilege escalations. So uh, we have two, we have two reds uh, running on two separate CPU cycles. Core zero and the core one. Uh, these two rest uh, do nothing in an infinite loop, and they just f used to flush the TLB. And when we gain the root privilege, uh, now uh, let's uh, run our real row hammer exploit. So after after the small blocks are drained, and we start to Allocate the SSI generic buffer uh, as well as the uh, page tables. And uh, after a memory threshold is reached, we can start row hammering. So
So after 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 Rohami for like uh, 39 times, we can find an exploitable page table, and we dump its uh, first eight entries, and uh, we can see that all the eight entries conform to the PT format. So now let's uh, change the let's uh, get the root privilege. So the basic idea is that. Um, to uh, we change we change the saved user ID effective user ID to the real user ID and do the same thing to the group ID, and then we can construct a, a case string composed of the three same user ID and the three same group ID, and uh, when we change one entry, um, when we change one PT entry with a different uh, physical uh, with a different physical number, the newly we check whether the newly mapped uh, page has the same has a case string. Uh, if yes, um, so so we can say that if yes, we have found a matching. So if yes, we have found a matching structure. We have found a matching structure of uh, credential. Credential is where the user ID resides. So we write three zeros. We write th uh, three zeros into the three user ID, the structure's user ID. Uh, the structures three user ID respectively, and uh, check and you uh, and then invoke the get UID function to check whether the current process user ID has been changed to zero. So if uh, if not, we try again, or we we still uh, we continue searching, and restore the restore the current uh, the current uh, structures uh, user ID to its back to its original state. And and by doing so, uh, we can by doing so we can we can say that uh, by doing so we can say that uh, we can locate the current process user ID and change it to zero. So during this process, uh, I I need to explain that um, the two rats the uh, during the process we have we have to flush the TLB because we change the PT entry. So um, this is be uh, this is because that we need to switch the Process uh, between core zero and core one, and uh, considering that the two rats are running on core zero and core one, once the current Rohamber exploit ha uh, has been scheduled on, on either call, the um, a contest switch will occur, and this will trigger an automatic TLB flash. So in the end, we can say that um, we have gained the root privilege. Okay, so that's all for our attack. Uh, So if someone uh, thinks that uh, disabling the SSI generic buffer is not enough to countermeasure our attack, we also we have also developed another exploitable brief lips. Uh, we have also uh, developed another exploitable buffer, the video buffer in the video for Linux subsystem. system. So actually, we have uh, other hammerable buffers uh, in these directories. So okay, so. Uh, the next, the next uh, copy is about the mitigation. So we have three possible mitigations. The first is to allocate the double end buffer from user partition. This is an intuitive solution, and the uh, the, the the other two defenses emerged after our submission to Black Hat. And all of those three solutions have their own limitations, and are not effective enough. Uh, for the first one. We can say that if we uh, allocate the double end buffer from the user partition, this can prevent the kernel from being hammered. However, uh, this will expose sensitive buffers to user space, still not secure enough. So for the second one, it is published in OSDI 2018, and the, sp the main idea is to separate uh, separate the uh, the row the row that contains data with two guiding rows. So. This method does, uh, suffers from the rule remapping and uh, does not consider the case where B flips can occur in multiple rows. The last one is to uh, place is to place the uh, table pages on two cells in DRAM. However, um, this uh, this method still suffers from the exportable B flips. So our go our ongoing work is that. So can we break all of them? This is a question mark, but we think it is possible. So please follow up our next Warhammer talk. So at last, we gave our some bites. 
uh, physical isolation uh, is powerful against uh, current Rohan attacks. However, it is uh, hard to achieve in practice due to the double end buffers, and this will make the Rohan bug still exploitable. So, um, the double end buffers are, the, are for the sake of uh, performance and the functionality, and uh, it is challenging to remove them. So, even facing the user and the kernel physical isolation, our exploit is still able to gain the root and the kernel privileges. Okay, so that's all for our talk. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Uh, this is, is our first uh, first speaker, Yue Changchen. So, any questions? Uh, you mean the this attack in the virtualized yeah. environment, right? Could yes. you attack the hypervisor or gain it, make uh, changes to? Uh, currently, this uh, target for the uh, kernel stuff, but for the hypervisor, like I think the parallel virtualized hypervisor is that definitely it can work. But for the full virtualized, uh, like uh, based on the Intel VTD and uh, VTX stuff, uh, this will be challenging. Uh, intuitively speaking, let me think. Uh, the hypervisor, we need a double ownership. Uh, that's very hard. Maybe not. Maybe not impossible. Yeah. But for the parallel virtualized environment, yeah, it's suffering. But for the full virtualized environment, if you have some parallel virtualized driver stuff, you mean also maybe possible. Well, depends on the, the real environment. If a pure full, full virtualized environment, I think this attack cannot happen. Yeah. Yeah. You you get the uh, Mac. Yeah. Uh, the open. Yeah. Turn on. Hello. Hi. So you mentioned uh, trying to bypass the most advanced row hammer defense. So did you also consider uh, if the parts itself, like most of the latest vendors, they claim that their parts itself, the DRAM parts itself are row hammer resistant. So is it like, uh, uh, I mean, is that the most, I mean, if you consider about hardware software, probably that is the most uh, advanced defense or do you mean the most advanced software defense without altering hardware? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Uh, yes, for the hardware defenses, there have some limitations we already listed in the slides. Currently, this the most advanced is the software-only uh, solutions. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so like going forward uh, for new devices, I think vendors would be using the parts which are DRAM resistant. So does this apply more to legacy products where there's not any option to change the DRAM part or even for forward looking devices uh, uh, which have DRAM parts which are Rohammer resistant, uh, will such exploits be realizable? Uh, I don't catch the K part. Can yeah, like uh, for new devices, uh, I think manufacturers will use the DRAM parts which are electrically Rohammer resistant. That's what the Oh, yeah. Memory vendors proclaim. That so, uh, have you explored those parts as well to mount such kind of attacks, or? Yeah, you mean if the f uh, hardware, the manufacturer fundamentally can fix this attack uh, from the like the team, that that's definitely can uh, completely stop this attack. But uh, until all the until now the all the existing um, the DRAM stuffs. They, they cannot completely uh, uh, solve this problem, actually. But due to the high density, they have uh, increasing from gigabyte to the terabyte. So the density stuff, maybe they need to uh, significantly change the hardware structures to address this problem. Yes. So, okay. 
No. Any questions? Yeah, I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you.